welcome to the talk on the fluid dynamics of tonometry an experimental and theoretical approach so in this particular talk we are going to talk about an interesting dynamics which involves the interaction of a air puff with a tear film of a human eye and uh, so i am shaktarshi basu i am going to present this particular talk and uh, the students involved are Durbar Roy, Sophia M, Abdul Rashid, Roshanjit Kobi, and my collaborator from Narayana Nitralaya, uh, Dr. Abhijit Siparoy. So uh, let us explain the procedure in a little bit more details. So if you ever visit an ophthalmologist for detection of glaucoma, uh, they use something what is called a non-contact tonometer. Uh, what the tonometer does is, that it basically ejects a puff of air into your eye and this puff of air is basically used to measure the intraocular pressure or IOP of the eye which is an indicative of glaucoma and uh, so what happens is that uh, this pressure and they measure it with a laser uh, they measure that what is the eye pressure essentially but uh, the hazard part of this particular procedure, though it looks contact free and it is very safe, is basically if your eye is teary, that means you have water in your eyes, watery eyes, uh, as this air puff interacts with a very thin tear film, which is of the order of uh, maybe a half a millimeter, the droplets are ejected out of that tear film, as you can see in some of the images uh, later on. So these images will show that there is a lot of ejection of droplets. Uh, this is done using scattering and fluorescence uh, by Fritz et al. Uh, so what happens is that these aerosols can actually contain uh, the coronavirus or COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, and this might actually lead to the spread of the disease. So most of the studies up to date have always concentrated on uh, the, the overall input and the output part of this particular procedure but nobody has got into the details that how this droplets are actually ejected what is the mechanism for the same and how universal is this particular phenomenon so in this particular talk we are going to look at this in more details so let me go to the next slide where it says gives the overview of the entire procedure this is also available in the Gallery of Fluid Motion 2020, entry number 48. So feel free to watch it over there as well. So this is a video which will give uh, the audience an idea that how this particular uh, procedure actually works and what is the mechanism for the generation of the droplets.
So in essence, as you can see from this nice little video, that what are the key phenomena that are involved? So if I have to put them in a, in a pictorial kind of an overview, what happens is that this is the experimental setup, which involves a non-contact tonometer, high-speed camera, light source, the laptop for data acquisition, and the tonometer operator, and the human subject, or the cadaver eye, whichever one we are going to use for this particular measurement. Now, first, initially what happens is that as soon as you press the tonometer, there is an air puff which comes out of the tonometer nozzle. This, there is a vortex ahead of it, and then there is a trailing jet. This particular vortex first interacts with the watery eye and leads to an initial sheet expansion. As you can see over there, the sheet expands due to the interaction of the vortex, as you saw in the video and in this particular picture, with the human eye. What happens subsequently is the trailing edge of the puff actually then impacts the eye and leads to this depression. This is called corneal deflection. Because of the corneal deflection, we create capillary waves, very strong capillary waves, as you can see from these ripples. Okay, they spread actually radially outward towards the rim of the eye. These capillary waves now combines with this initial sheet expansion that is already created and leads to a vigorous sheet expansion, which is called phase E in this particular work. This sheet now uh, in the and exhibits what we call the Rayleigh Taylor instability. So as you can see, there is a Taylor ring and then these are the finger-like structures that are actually formed. These finger-like structures subsequently get stretched because of Rayleigh Plateau instability and then they get detached and form these daughter droplets. These daughter droplets are the ones which are basically ejected with a certain velocity and they can infect uh, any human beings uh, around or it can also form fomites which basically droplets which impacts the surface. So this is in short the lifetime of this entire event uh, which lasts for a few seconds only. And so the key feature to note over here is that there is an initial vortex expansion which leads to an initial sheet expansion. Subsequently, a trailing jet creates a depression of the eye, causes capillary waves, which leads to Rayleigh Taylor uh, sheet expansion, which leads to subsequent uh, deformation and breakup of the ligaments into daughter droplets due to Rayleigh Plato instability. And these droplets are the ones which spreads the disease. So let us look at each of these phases, A, B, C, D, and E, and F in detail. So initially, as you can see, this is the vortex, which you can see. So this is the vortex, uh, this is the leading edge of the vortex, and then there is a trailing uh, jet. So the vortex is designated by this R1 and R2, which is the inner and the outer core of the leading vortex, and then you have the trailing jet. So as you can see, this is the pathway that is traversed by the vortex where x being the distance from the thermometer nozzle and r also shows no expansion initially because this vortex core is largely intact both r1 and r2 but subsequently it undergoes expansion after it hits the eye because uh, as it hits the eye as it impacts the eye and uh, flows along it it's like an obstacle now so it basically spreads along the eye and therefore the r actually increases so the leading edge vortex travels at approximately five meter per second, and it takes approximately two milliseconds to interact with the boat eye, cadaver boat eye, or human eye, whatever may be the case. So if we look at phase B now, because of this interaction of these vortices, what happens is that you have a pressure differential that is created because of the vortex, vortex uh, interaction with the tear film. This actually causes the sheet around the lower eyelid that is actually there, okay, where it actually mates with the eyelid or the eyelashes and it undergoes an expansion, okay, in that particular regime. As you can see over here, from zero to three milliseconds, this particular droplet or this particular eye uh, ligament sheet, uh, basically undergoes an expansion as you can see over here, right? So this can be nicely represented by this particular equation. Okay, so uh, this equation represents what is the change in velocity of the sheet, okay, uh, and it is mapped with the air velocity, that is the impact velocity of the of the vortex. And by using the suitable boundary conditions, okay, and the initial conditions, 
we actually get a fairly accurate theoretical descriptions of the expansion of this liquid sheet that is how this r basically this r indicates the extent of expansion how this r actually expands that is how this r actually changes with time and this matches fairly well with the theoretical expressions that we have derived okay so here please remember that v sheet which is the velocity of the sheet is nothing but the change in the rate of this radial position of the tear pool. In this particular case, it is how this how this particular uh, ligament or this sheet actually changes, length of the sheet, how it actually changes with time. So that is how this has been articulated. And you can see this is the surface tension of the air-water uh, interface, basically the surface tension between air and water. So this is basically the equation, and this is how we get a fairly good description how the initial sheet will actually expand. Coming to phase C, now in phase C what happens is that after the initial uh, vertical interaction is over, the trailing jet actually now impacts uh, the eye or the cornea in this particular case and it undergoes deflection. Remember these times are all relative times, so every time is reset in their corresponding phases. So it is not like that this particular time is uh, kind of, uh, you know, is from the initial time instant, it is uh, related to the phase. So in this phase C, your time is reset from t equal to zero. So as you can see, in up to about 7.5 milliseconds, uh, the corneal deflection is actually over. So initially, this is the initiation of the depression, then it depresses quite a bit, and then it actually relaxes back. And if you plot the corneal deflection, you will find that this will show a distribution like this, where it peaks around five, milliseconds or so and the entire phenomenon is over in about 10 milliseconds so this is the corneal deflection and it deflects by about a millimeter okay now there is difference between run to run as you can see these are uh, realization of multiple runs this happens because the human eye like the human blood pressure actually varies in the intraocular pressure and as a result of that there is run to run variation and these are multiple subjects also are involved so, but they show one familiar trend that they all peak around say five milliseconds, show a similar trajectory, although the value of the deflection will vary according to the intraocular pressure. So, once this, uh, once this uh, trailing jet actually impacts the eye, the, we get what we call the capillary waves. So, the capillary waves is basically designated as phase D in our particular work. So, what happens is that this, this impact of the trailing jet into a liquid pool essentially, in this case it's a shallow pool, it, it once again leads to the radially expanding uh, waves of the tear film, which is designated as x equal to 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now these happens over a time period of about approximately 1.5 milliseconds. Again, the time has been reset for this particular phase. Now if you observe this very closely, you will find that if you write the, the standard capillary flow dispersion equation, you will get a phase velocity and a group velocity. Once you plot them together, okay, and depending on the wavelength, the wavelength is basically the distance between these two uh, subsequent peaks, uh, you will find that uh, mostly the wavelengths lie around say 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 or 0.5 to 0.8 kind of millimeter, and they agree quite well with the, with the existing uh, phase velocity and the group velocity that comes from the theoretical uh, dispersion relationship. So this is an overall a very accurate description of what how the capillary waves leads to a spread uh, in, in the liquid film. It's basically a perturbation on the liquid film which basically propagates radially outwards towards the edge which is basically the, the edge of the eye where it meets the eye meets the lower part. So this leads to phase E which is uh, additional expansion of the liquid sheet. So please remember that initially we had the liquid sheet which was created by the vertical interaction and it was already had a certain amount of growth because of the because of the vortex structure. What happens after that is that you basically ram in a capillary wave on the top of it. So basically there is an, another perturbation which travels quite fast and basically reinforces this liquid sheet which is ejecting and this is the phenomena, if you look at it very carefully, that this is the phenomena that the liquid sheet now undergoes. Previously, it was very benign. It was very well behaved. 
it was just coming out as a nice little sheet. Now you tend to see that there is a sharp increase in the rate of the expansion, which is also seen if you plot this radius r once again now with respect to time, there is a clear change in the gradient. So initial sheet shows a very mild gradient, whereas it undergoes a much sharper expansion uh, in the later stages around say three or four milliseconds, uh, three to four milliseconds later. So, uh, and we are able to model both of them using our, our, th our theoretical limits and it agrees quite well. Uh, though the experimental data is a multitude of different sheets, it's no longer a very, um, very uh, uniform phenomenon, but it kind of is well described by our model or by the scaling arguments that we have put forward. So this sheet now expands uh, and as it expands, as you can see, it shows a lot of perturbations at the edge and we will just look at these perturbations in the next slide. What happens is that these perturbations are essentially relative uh, instability. So again, once you uh, write the dispersion relationship for the relative, you will find that there are three major components. One component one actually represents the, the relative velocity of the expanding sheet with respect to the surrounding airfield. Okay, the component two is the effective acceleration component and so the effective acceleration that is encountered by this expanding sheet and the, and the last one is basically the surface tension effect which tries to pull the sheet back. So, uh, so the real part uh, of this dispersion relationship is given by this. So if you plot it, you can see for different rates of the velocity or the relative velocity of the uh, expanding sheet with respect to the surrounding airfield, one meter, four meter, eight meter, whereas four and eight are the most relevant to these particular studies, you can clearly see that there is a change in the wave number. So it shifts more towards the right with the increase in the, in the velocity scale. Now, if you now plot the PDF of the distance between the fingers, as you can see, these are the fingers that are formed, which is a characteristic feature of our relative instability. Now, these fingers, the distance between the fingers, if you just plot the PDF of that, basically plot all the probable distances between the fingers and plot it here, you will find that observationally we do get a slightly bigger band. The reason for that is that it's a multimodal kind of an expansion. But in the theoretical premise, if we are predicting somewhere around say 2.5 to 2.6 millimeter where the peak should be and it agrees quite well with the observational peak that we see from our experiments. Similarly, the time scale, the time scale uh, which is basically the reciprocal of the growth rate of these instabilities that is also plotted. And you can see that the that once again, the observational time scale is can vary anywhere between zero to all the way up to six milliseconds. Though the peak time scale, that is the most frequently encountered time scale, is of the order of about three milliseconds or so, which we saw in the previous slides as well. Now, the theoretical estimate estimates it's around two milliseconds, which given the complexity of the measurements, or given the complexity of the expansion, is quite a reasonable estimate of the same. So basically the sheet undergoes the Rayleigh Taylor expansion, forms these fingers, which basically grows in order to um, uh, detach uh, into smaller droplets, as you will see in the next. Is F, which is basically the droplet ejection, and uh, this ejection happens due to Rayleigh Plato instability. Once again, we can write a dispersion relationship for Rayleigh Plato instability, where you know uh, so. T naught is the principal parameter, which is the initial thickness of the ligament, as we saw in the video also. And the tau of the relic plateau is basically the inverse of the maximum growth rate. So if you recall the relic plateau criteria, one can see that the length versus the width of the ligaments has to exceed pi. This is the ligament breakup criteria, where L is the length of the ligament. Now, if you plot this L by D or L by T naught, right in this particular case where D is basically equal to T naught for multiple runs. So we have close to about 80 runs in this particular case. The blue line actually indicates the pi. So anything which is above this blue line should undergo breakup, which is indeed the case. The red points all shows that these are the ligaments that undergo breakup, whereas the green ones are the ligaments which basically grows and then they will retract back because they don't satisfy the relative criteria. 
Similarly, if we look at the PDF now, that is the time scale for this particular breakup, you will find that the theoretical and the experimental time scales match quite well and it all shows a peak around say, two milliseconds or so. So this is approximately the phenomena, approximately the time in which the phenomena is over. You can see this is t equal to zero, this is t equal to 1.5 where the detachment actually happens. So close to two milliseconds is the order of this particular phenomenon. And as you can see, the dispersion curves actually notes that okay, if you have a thinner ligament, thicker ligament, which is 0.43 or so, the, the, the growth rate of these ligaments is rather small. Whereas if you have a, uh, have a ligament which has got a smaller uh, or a lower width uh, or initial thickness, it grows rather fast. So this expression also says now that after the relativator creates the fingers, these fingers now undergo stretching and they undergo relative instability before detaching and forming these daughter droplets. Daughter droplets now subsequently, as you can see, they come out with a certain x and y velocities. Okay, as you can see in this particular rectangular component, if we just track a few droplets like this, and indeed we have tracked quite a few. And we find that the droplets are a little bit elliptical in shape. That means A and B are basically the major and the minor axes of the ellipse, so to say. And so basically the droplets do show some elliptical feature and uh, they come in all kinds of sizes. We get droplets which are sub-millimeter to all the way up to about three millimeter. But most of the droplet sizes lies around a millimeter in length, which is not strictly aerosols, but there are quite a few droplets in the lower uh, diameter range also in the range of 100 and 200 microns. Now these droplets now exhibit both x and y velocities. In this case the directionality of the velocities are not very important because you can spread the droplets in all possible directions. You can see that their droplet velocity can become as high as about 3 to 4 meter per second and uh, in the positive or adding the uh, in the positive and the negative directions essentially but most of the droplets actually share a velocity which is very close to zero which is about 0.1 meter per second so these droplets won't spread much and cause havoc but the droplets which has a velocity of approximately three to four meter per second and depending on their size if they fall in this particular range which is a lower droplet size range they can actually cause significant amount of infection in summary, what we have is that the entire phenomenon of tonometry, which is regularly used to measure the intraocular pressure in case of glaucoma, uh, basically can be uh, segmented into uh, many regimes. First regime would be the air path ejection and traveling, then the interaction of the vortex with the, with the eye tear film. It creates an initial sheet expansion. Subsequently, the air puff or the trailing jet impacts the cornea. This creates a capillary waves which reinforces the sheet and the sheet expands rather fast now, creating this finger-like structures, which is basically a Rayleigh Taylor instability. This Rayleigh Taylor instability causes these fingers, Rayleigh Plato instability and the subsequent inertia actually causes stretching of these ligaments and they form these droplets. These droplets subsequently can go and spread infection by COVID-19. So in short, this is what the summary actually looks like. Please feel free to uh, see the GFM video once again, which is available, which can give an idea or a pictorial description of the entire process. So in conclusion, we have uncovered the fluid mechanics during non-contact thermometry. We have also established the mechanisms of different phenomena and the order of events in which they happen. The relative time scales and the length scales are important over here. The droplets are ejected and the droplet sizes can be anywhere between 100 micron to 3 millimeter. The 100 micron droplets can aerosolize and can cause uh, COVID infection. The droplet velocity scales is approximately 0.1 meter, but as we saw, there can be droplets which have a velocity as high as 4 meter per second. These droplets can act as carrier of viruses like SARS-CoV-2, which is basically uh, basically the reason why these procedures have to be carried out with extreme care. We like to acknowledge the Narayana Netralaya Eye Hospital Bangalore for providing us with a non-contact thermometer and their help in designing the experiments. We are also thankful for the funding received from the Defense Research and Development Organization Chair Professorship 
And so thank you for listening and we should be available to take any questions that you might have in the next uh, few minutes. Thank you.